Chapter 11 The Feast The woods are changing, Caitlin whispered as they slipped between the massive trunks of trees. She was right, Hale thought. After following the horde for what felt like an hour, the underbrush had thinned and the spaces between the trees had widened. It's this, Val said, kicking at a pile of spore on the ground. It released a smell akin to cat urine and pig feces. Droppings of these monsters, he said with a nod to Storm, who led the way, hiding behind one tree, then the next. This shite must kill everything that tries to grow from the forest floor. Storm hissed for quiet, putting his stump to his mouth and pointing upwards with an extended claw. Caitlin stifled a gasp. Just above their heads, hanging like bats from the tree branches, were more of the creatures. So close were they that Hale could see the mess of interlocking and twisted teeth, the folded conical ears, the enormous nostrils. Their eyes were closed, as if in sleep. Cody guided his sword out of his sheath. Val, Hale, and Caitlin followed suit. The trees began to have an ordered appearance. Each was equidistant from the next, and they seemed arranged in long, straight colonnades, which, in turn, formed corridors and, in places, small rooms or large chambers. The place was part forest and part fortress. Looking left and right, Hale saw the larger gray creatures, awake and moving in dim torchlight. Hale could hear their ghoulish voices as they communicated with grunts, hisses, and guttural groans. Occasionally, a howl would echo throughout the forest, reverberating between the trunks and freezing the four of them in place. Storin continued on, unperturbed, followed by the elk. There was no trust between them. The elk followed Storin closest, his rack of antlers lowered so the points hovered just behind the imp's neck. Between the howls and the grunts of the beasts, the forest was otherwise silent. Gone were the noises of other forest creatures. Everything here that was not a monster had fled or was dead. Ahead, a light appeared between trunks. Hale moved to get a better look and noticed Storm was slowing down, the hair on his back standing on end. It was firelight they saw. It grew and spread, silhouetting the trees like light from behind prison bars. Hale stepped on something that rolled under his foot. Picking it up, he realized it was too light to be stone and too heavy to be wood. It was curved like a fragment of a bowl, but not cold like porcelain. Realizing what it was, he dropped it with a shudder where it fell among a mess of other skulls, some human, some not. Cody let out a disgusted curse, while the elk made a loud huff like an angry horse. Val waved at them all to be quieter. Caitlin was unable to comply, running back behind a tree and retching. Hale stood stupidly, unsure as to move forward or go back and help Caitlin. What were they doing? Why had it felt so important to follow and save this girl? Something was pawing at him. It was Storn, poking at the severed claw and holding out his good one, empty. You want it? Hale asked. Not yet. You have to get us out of here, too. Only then, when we are safe, do you get it. Storn snarled, then turned away. Hale and Val followed now, with the others bringing up the rear. In the chamber ahead of them, the monsters, giant greys and impish greens, were gathered round a fallen tree turned into a table of sorts, Storn pointed around a trunk. By the way he cowered, Hale sensed this place was the center of things, the deepest recess of the creature's lair, and the worst of Storn's betrayal. Hale kept a hand to the severed claw, loath to let go of their only leverage over the imp. Before he could step forward for a better look, Val took him by the arm. Prince, we might not all get out of this one alive, he said. Are you saying we should turn back? He said, looking into the captain's eyes. They were focused, hard as steel. No. You've chosen righteously. But sometimes the righteous can do the right thing and still lose. It is one of the hardest lessons to learn. Hale swallowed. For a moment he felt he understood Val. 
his life of great idealism and great disappointment better than ever. The captain, despite his scars and his burden of loss, was the most honorable man Hale knew. Hale felt a terrible fear swell within him, not of the creatures or what fate might await them in the clearing ahead, but a fear of disappointing yet another mentor, as he had disappointed his father. He was not sure if it was admiration or love he felt for Val in that moment. Maybe it was just a misplaced desire to please his own father, but Hale knew his choice was already made. The forest shook with howling and screeching, and for a moment a whole chorus of the beasts' collective voices. A great commotion roiled in the clearing. Creatures shifted and parted, and Hale saw the bloody remains of something, someone on the table. He was afraid they were too late. Then he was afraid the commotion meant they had been discovered, but none of the creatures looked in their direction. Instead, they were all turned towards the end of the chamber to Hale's left. He and Val pressed closer to the tree between them. The din of the horde was such that it drowned out any sounds they could make. Hale and Val made their way over ground littered with cracked and splintered bones. One of the jays made a somber whistle from the elk's antlers. Cody cursed. The room was larger than Hale would have guessed, longer than it was wide. Soot from the torches had turned the branches above them black, but the trunks below were stained white and brown, bone dust and blood. Two greys carried in the girl he had seen before. She was stripped of her armor and clad only in her fabric garments, a simple tunic and breeches. Her limbs were tied to two ragged logs. The two greys dropped her on the table. The logs overlapped just behind the small of her back, bending her entire body painfully upwards, her tunic parted from her belt, the soft skin of her midriff exposed. Behind the two greys followed a tall one, his scales a dark blue-black, his head crowned with a headpiece of braided gold. This blue-black thing bent down over the girl, the horde silencing as he neared her. His teeth moved. He was speaking. She was turned away. One of the greys handed a curved sword to the blue-black creature. It was made of brownish metal, with a green patina growing on it. The blue-black thing drew his hands over the girl's face, lifting up her hair. Hale had been mistaken. She was not looking away, but directly into the eyes of the monster before her, defiant. He could see the white of her skin stained red by the rivulets of blood that trickled from her wound, and her burning blue eyes that stared unflinching into the nightmare above her. The beast's neck bent in a fluid motion, the braided golden crown shifting slightly. He moved backwards, the nails of his feet rasping on the table. His fingers tightened around the sword, and his eyes narrowed to slits. It was strange to watch the language of his body. In some ways he was readable like any human. It was almost as if a human was dressed in a costume of the creature. Yet in other ways he was pure animal. An overgrown lizard, tongue flicking among his teeth, yellow eyes darting. The other creatures were already pulling at the girl's limbs. Fingers wrapped around her throat. Hale realized he could not stand to see her flesh rent again. She gave a cry. The blue-black thing lifted his sword. The jays cried out in surprise as the elk leapt forward into the clearing with a deep bellow. He caught two green imps immediately on the ends of his antlers, impaled them, then flung them, their own blood spiraling outward into the trees. I guess we're not waiting, Val said, and rushed into the clearing after the elk. Hale followed, aware of Cody and even Caitlin scrambling over bones and skulls after him. Hale's fear turned to rage as he looked upon the scene before him, the helpless girl, the hideous things with their ravenous mouths. He wished for all their deaths, for their complete extinction. Two more green creatures leapt at him, but his sword was up and cleaved them into halves. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Caitlin stab one with a yell and Cody kick another in the face before running another through. They were mad, all five of them, warriors, butchers, and hopefully saviors. The creatures panicked, in complete pandemonium, while Hale and his companions cut them down, stabbed them in their scaly necks, and slashed at their leathery bellies. 
The monsters began to form ranks around the table. Hale ran forward before his path to the girl was cut off, but gasped as he was thrust aside and went tumbling. A green creature was standing on him. It scratched and bit at him wildly, ripping at his clothes. The terror of it broke him out of any controlled, practiced defense he knew, and he kicked and swung at any bit of the monster that he could. It was Caitlin who drove into its side with her short sword, knocking it off. Cody ran it through with his sword that was already dark with oily black blood. Caitlin reached down to help Hale up, but she was tackled from behind by another one of the creatures. This one pinned her to the ground with its legs and moved to rake her neck open with his claws. Hale scrambled across the ground, but it was another creature that fell upon the first and twisted him off. Storn. Their guide, or whatever he was, squared off with his own brethren before they both charged, tangling and growling like wild dogs in a fight for dominance. The elk made a second foray into the ranks lined up around the table. Some resisted, others fled. A path opened to the girl, and Hale dashed into it, leaping on the table and taking aim at the blue-black leader standing astride her. At the last moment, he sensed Hale's swing and jumped away, quick as a frog, dropping his sword to clatter on the table behind him. Hale lost his footing and fell down on the frame holding the girl. Their foreheads collided. Quick, my hands, she yelled. Hale scrambled for his sword, feeling clumsy and foolish. When he got to his feet, a green beast was taking a swipe at him with spread claws, a cat in an alley, grown to prodigious proportions. Hale stabbed at the thing, but missed again. The girl screamed, My hands! Her right hand bent upwards like some bound bird. Hale cut the bindings. She reached over, and before he could even step over her to cut her other hand loose, she was sitting upright, both hands free. Another beast jumped up to the table, and this one Hale caught solidly in the chest with his sword. He heard the girl's voice again, a tone of command. Unvoiced! Was she talking to him? He looked over his shoulder to see her bent over her foot, which was now free, vine bindings falling from it like untied bootlaces as she stood. The creature Hale had impaled writhed as he stepped on it and pulled the sword out with a sickening slurp. Two more came charging at him. He swung. One he cut deeply across the neck, but the other he barely caught with the point of his sword. The impact knocked Hale to his knees. Now three more came running up the table, their claws digging in, throwing up bits of rotten wood. He could hear Storn struggling with other attackers behind him. Val, Cody, and Caitlin were too far to help. This was the end. He had overreached. Then the girl jumped back between them, armed with the sword the blue-black leader had discarded. She swung and caught one attacker square on the head, another with a slice across the neck, and the third she kicked in the face. She turned to Hale. He was staring without words. She had to yell at him to turn around, where he caught another approaching beast on the end of Elkhard. He turned and, now with more confidence, caught the next attack. The three of them— Hale, the girl, and Storn formed a triangle on the table, their backs to each other. Caitlin, Cody, and Val formed another on the floor, while the elk crashed through the monster's numbers, his antlers bloodier than any of their swords, the jays circling above and diving like darts for the eyes of the creatures. Claws reached for Hale's sword, but he hacked at them, his blade making a singing noise as the black nails went flying loose. Soon, more of the hideous things began dropping in from branches above. The clearing was filled with more monsters than there had been in the original horde. Hale guessed that the ones they had seen sleeping had now awakened and joined the fray. He was looking for a way to flee, but it was a solid sea of leather skin around them. Confusion and surprise, Hale realized, was the only reason he and the others had not been torn to shreds. Yet... The beasts had rushed at them haphazardly, with no reason or logic in their attack, but more like animals moved only by the instinct to defend and kill. But that had changed. A line of greys reformed ranks on the periphery of the chamber, and then moved to attack. A thud on the table behind Hale caused him to turn. To his horror, one of the greys had landed just behind him and was already swinging a pole axe at his head. No time to parry, Hale could only duck. 
Then the creature fell with a gasp. The girl had smote him. Hill went to rise, but he suddenly felt a great compression on his shoulder. The girl was standing on him. Then her weight was gone. Hale looked up, only to see another gray thing descending upon him, his wings beating furiously, his eyes fixed upon Hale's neck. But then the shape of the girl flew in front of him. Her arms jerked the sword across the beast, and his narrow eyes widened. There was a sudden rain of hot, black blood. Drops obscured Hale's vision, and he cried out. The stuff burned like acid. He knew others would see this as an opportunity to attack, so he forced his eyes open and spun around. A charging creature impaled itself on the end of Elkhard. He fended off two more before he could take a chance to wipe his eyes with his sleeve. The girl had landed at the far end of the table. Another gray was descending between them. The glance upwards burned Hale's eyes anew, but before they involuntarily clenched shut, he saw the girl rise into the air with all the grace of a dancer. Hale felt the thud of the dead thing on the table. The girl was beside him suddenly, landing without sound. He felt her touch his shoulder. It's the blood. I can't see. He sensed her turn and strike something. He heard the screech of one of the monsters. You will have to, she said. He listened as she spat into her hands, then pressed them to his eyes. Her saliva was hot and soothing. He forced his lids open. By now, the rhythm of the battle was in him, and he turned to catch the expected attack from behind. He spun back to her. She was kicking two beasts off Storn. Hale's left eye was fogged with tears, casting everything in a halo of light. He thought he would go blind from the burning sensation. His right eye flickered open and shut, and still the beasts came running. He forgot all training. He was swinging without thought, without technique, only to survive. The tide had shifted. Now he and his friends were those without a plan, without order. He felt as if he was running out of air. There was no relief. He killed few beasts. Mostly he mauled them horribly, and then they came charging back at him, terrible visages, mangled by his own fear and a blade he could barely control. Gaping maws, red throats, snarling voices. It was like being a piece of meat among rabid dogs. He swung, wholly sure that a creature would get past him on his blind side, or simply from straight ahead of him. This was nothing like the stories of battles he had heard of in songs. But, inexplicably... A lull came. Hale rubbed his eyes again. Some of the rings of gold about the torches disappeared, and the fluttering of his right eye slowed. He saw that the clearing was full of dead monsters, or wounded ones clambering on stumps. What have we done? He thought of Storn. The creature was still there on the table, cut and bleeding, but alive. So was the girl. He performed an inventory of the rest of his friends. Val and Cody were back to back. Caitlin bent over and winded between them. The elk chased a screaming green imp into the trees. But the woods were not still. They could all hear the clatter of arms and the commotion of voices. The things were regrouping. Hale knew he and his friends had to flee. Now. They had no chance otherwise. The ground, the table, the trees were slippery with blood. He tried to find a spot on his hand that was not covered with the oily stuff, so he could wipe his eyes once more. Val came up alongside them. We have to go. The girl, unmoved by his tone of command, replied, Wait. Are you mad? Val asked. I'm nearly blind, Hale said. She turned her eyes on him. Her cheek wounds were bright with her own fresh blood weeping down her face and neck. Her hair was matted with the stuff. And you are wounded as well. We cannot last, Hale added, trying to add a note of pleading to his voice, but he suspected it sounded more like desperation. As if she just remembered her wound, her hand went protectively to her cheek. Her whole demeanor changed as she did so. Her shoulders slouched a bit, the blade of her sword dipped, and her eyes grew sad and doubtful. She winced as she moved her jaw, but Hale could see her pain fuse back into anger. The stature of a warrioress returned, and she shook her sword. He knew then there was no dissuading her. Wait, she said again, an unmistakable command. Hale could not refuse. 
but he climbed down off the table and gathered with his friends, putting an arm around Caitlin and pulling her close to his chest. The noises of the horde massed at one end of the clearing. The sound of trampling feet synchronized into a drumbeat of marching. Hale wiped his eyes, his tears narrowing his vision to a tunnel of clarity, surrounded by blobs of cloudy light. He had to whip his head all about just to see what was around him. What he could see was that the gaps between the trees were dark with moving figures. Some played the part of beasts, crawling along the trunks and swinging up into the boughs. Others played the part of men, mostly the gray ones, filing in, wisdom and ken in their eyes, armed now with bows and arrows. A few shots flew by the girl's head, but for the most part the creatures restrained themselves. There was order to this attack. More greys began dropping in from above. These were fresh to the fight. Wings beat and clapped. Hale kept looking over his shoulder. A spot of clear woods he had previously eyed as their avenue of escape was growing smaller. Still the girl was standing, her sword at the ready and her legs spread wide, as if the table she stood upon was a ship rocking at sea. A change swept over the beasts. They scraped at the ground with their claws and snorted through their porcine noses. Their mouths worked open and close, their mess of teeth overlapping and interlocking at odd angles. Did the girl not realize that they were organizing a new attack? How could they afford to remain here? He looked at Val, who was sheathing his sword. If the fool doesn't move, I'll carry her out. Then the trees darkened, branches snapped apart, and a gargantuan nightmare came tearing into the clearing. It flailed arms wrapped in spiked iron bangles, ran on legs covered in a coat of bristling black hair, and swung a head crowned by two massive yellow horns. This thing charging, this dervish of snarling, hissing, and extended claws, was like the other creatures, but ever so much larger. Its teeth were gold, its eyes black, its skin a bright heart of the furnace red. Its wings were huge and flailing like black sails. In place of one eye, a gray scar ran down its face and into its maw of golden teeth, and it veered its head in wide arcs from left to right to take in the entire scene with its good eye. Hale felt the breeze from its wings and could smell the creature's stench, something akin to a dead cow rotting in a tar pit. It had all the mass and exaggerated size of a statue cut from stone, and its red skin looked just as impervious. But, unlike a statue, this perversion of reality, this horror come to life, could move, and with the alacrity of a raging bear it trampled over the other beasts in its path and made straight for the girl. The other creatures' voices rose up in a ravenous chorus. Even the larger greys looked like little imps in comparison to the monstrosity. But the others held their ground. They were but spectators to this attack. The red thing clutched a whip, the end of which shone with metal studs. As Hale followed the path of the whip, he saw its ends pass over the head of the blue-black creature, the leader with the braided golden crown, newly armed with a gold scimitar. The red beast bent forward, one arm smashing the end of the table, the other swinging the whip at the girl. Like a dancer, she snapped her body in a backflip, heels overhead, landing out of reach of the whip, leaving its studs to rake the empty air. Her feet settled on the uneven table and found an animal skull which she kicked into the face of the beast. It growled and readied its whip once more. Hale realized that all that had come before in the forest, the noises, the vines, the mysterious whispering shadows, all had only been prelude to this. These monsters were the true curse of Sidon. Better they had been left undisturbed. He was no stronger than those that had built Cadre within night's reach. Like them, he had tempted the fates of the forests, stirred its mysteries, challenged these monsters, and now he and his friends would be punished. Then there was the girl, standing athwart the table that had been intended as the place of her dismemberment, and as improbable as it was, 
She was staring down the beast, which closed the distance between them in two easy steps, its whip shooting out again, its mouth gaping in a wet, golden grin, its nails hanging like curved swords. The girl did not back away, nor did she jump. This time, she ducked, as if this was all a dance, and she knew the steps beforehand. The beast coiled the whip back, gathering it in the air over its shoulder for another strike. To Hale's surprise, the girl closed in on the creature. The studded thongs changed direction and moved to meet her, but halfway, she flung her own sword end over end from above her head. She cried out with the effort, locks of her hair flying. The sword made a deep hum as it wheeled and a clang like a ruined bell as it sliced off one of the nails of the great beast. The girl's momentum flung her forward, and she landed, skidding to a stop, her arms outstretched just a finger's length from the thing's legs. Hale was sure now that she was beyond help, but the throw had been accurate, and the force deadly. The sword was lodged, handle swang, in the remaining eye of the blinded beast. A fountain of tar was streaming forth, raining on her. The giant made no noise. At first, Hale thought it was stunned, for it stood still, its mouth open, teeth frozen in mid-gasp, claws in mid-grasp. Then, Hale realized its stillness was more than being stunned. It was dead. It dropped slowly backwards, as if it took a long time for its dead weight to build the momentum or make the decision to fall. When it did, the other creatures let out a shocked and panicked wail. They scrambled out of the way, but they had not expected the beast to fall, and there were too many of them gathered in its shadow. Many did not escape, and as it crashed down onto the forest floor, it pinned a tangled mass of beasts beneath it. The girl was running back now, dancing lightly between the gore on the table, somersaulting down to the level ground alongside Hale and the others, and breaking for a gap in the trees, the bone grit grinding under her feet as she stopped and turned to them. Now we run!